uh, feel free to ask any remaining questions or whatever you want. And my very first question, when is your master's thesis due? Uh, 4th of 11th, uh, 4th of September. So 4th of September, yeah. Uh, 11, no, no. November. November. Uh, that's November. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other that sounds very silly. I always get them mixed up as well. <laughs> Any question? I have a, a more general question, maybe. Um, I don't understand everything, uh, I say, uh, should say, but um, when I understand it correctly, PIC is uh, originally uh, completely in a classical sense, yeah. simulating particles in a, in a plasma. And uh, atomic states are a completely quantum mechanical thing. Mm -hmm. And when I, if I understand it correctly, the, what is the connection between these two kinds of description? Is it a population vector or is it, what is the point where you can point on there is the transition between the quantum mechanical description of an at atom and the classical description of an electron simulation or of a plasma simulation. In essence, the population vector, because uh, due to the fact that you have a, that the quantum mechanics describe your atomic states as discrete, you also get a discrete vector in contrast to a classical representation, which would give you some sort of uh, continuous variable for that. So yeah, in specific, this uh, population vector is the uh, interface. But, but are there some side effects of this approach? Um, Maybe some overlapping of states or something like this? Due to the fact that we're using a real mathematical base? No. Um, yeah. There's, there's um, even Flylight or Flycheck as one of the standard tools in this field does that. If you're looking at a quantum mechanical potential, usually it looks something like this, you know, an atomic potential, it somehow levels off, it might be a bit wobbly or whatever, it doesn't matter, <laughs> but it levels off at some point. And so if you are getting close to the end of this potential, so to higher and higher energies, where finally an electron go, can go out as a real electron and wander around freely, the difference in energy between those states become shorter and shorter and shorter. There are infinitely many states at some point. You know, you could, whatever Brian does as, as prerequisites doesn't help. It's infinitely many, you know, you, you can't really do that. But what you can do is, and what Flycheck and other tools are actually doing is they're saying, ah, uh, the difference to the free electron is very small, close to the boundary. The effect, because they're all very close to each other, statistically doesn't matter much. So I'm basically taking a final band here. I'm saying, okay, after n equals seven or n equals eight or whatever, it's just one thick band. And there is a certain probability to become real and, and wander around or to go back again. It's a very crude estimation, but statistically and on average, it's not that bad. The other thing, and that's much worse actually in many cases, is the assumption of an hydrogen atom and that there is no interaction. Because what you can have is states that overlap, that can really go between two atoms. And this is just not there. It's not there. No, no way we can do this up until now. And we have to think how, how we could better include this, because that would basically mean that we have to somehow create an effective atom, atom interaction that somehow tells me how those two different uh, 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 occupation vectors interact in some way. Probably doable. Yeah. Don't know how yet. Have to see. But these are very special cases, for example, really high pressure, really low energy, where you see this, where you really press the atoms close enough that an electron can jump over. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So Max can. Um, yeah, that's actually where I want to ask because. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> <a> <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> no, no, no. It's another thing. Um, 
you are in the health state issue, you suddenly have beds for a child, you're not in the atomic beds are not included in pig. Yes, if they're not included in pig, I can't do anything for that. Yeah, that's that's that's, <laughs> that's not separate from me. That has significant can have significant uh, yes, because on your yeah. pig does not go to the solid state. It doesn't cover anything. Like that. But the 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 current research program is pushing things that are really thought for for the absolute ground state to higher higher energies on the one side, and on the other side, pushing things that were really meant for very very high energies downwards to much lower energies. And in both cases, we're really pushing the limits of these methods strongly. And if you have a very close look, things get really ugly in terms of justifying what you're doing. But the final justification is, can I predict what I'm seeing in the experiment? Very simple, you just do it. And as long as it doesn't break, everything is fine, basically. You will always feel ashamed of yourself and somewhat dirty and take a lot of showers. Nevertheless, it works. That's the current current approach. And of course, trying to find better methods at the boundary. That's a much harder thing to do. We have in pick when the higher energy laser interacts with the foil. We do not just have warm, dense matter. We have relativistic electrons going through at the same time. We can have so high and then high intensities that the radiation reaction of the field actually plays a role. So we have QED, quantum mechanics, and standard plasma physics in this, and warm, dense matter in the same one micron of space. Yeah. <laughs> You just don't do these experiments. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, regarding your point at this point of the environment, so what you, one option is what you could do is you have to break your analytical form of the hydrogenic orbitals. Mm -hmm. But what you could do is this one option is in the context of quantum embedding, where you write, you basically you can write, what I imagine is you can write your pick as some sort of functional theory. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, okay, I treat my atoms as individual entities in a global effective potential. And so this will basically change your Schrodinger equation. So you have an additional potential to your Schrodinger equation. And that will change your electronic structure, but it will take into account your surrounding atoms. So you can probably do this in an approximate way using what you have. Yeah. It might be one way, but you will break your analytical solutions, right? The yeah. hydrogenic orbitals will not be anymore your <laughs> solutions, but it will be an, uh, an approximate way to treat, to take the environment into account. So I don't know how much, uh, but I mean, if it's analytical, and now you have to find a numerical solution, you will increase the computational cost, but probably not dramatically because you're still, it's still a radial problem, but you're just limited to one atom. You don't have to deal with many atoms. Or well, you interpolate a numerical solution. Like well, there's some kind of a lookup table for it uh, with all its dependencies. Well, you have to solve the Equation. Ah, you need to solve the non-tracking equation. Oh, okay. Okay. But it's still <laughs> relatively cheap. I don't know if it's cheap compared to yeah. your scale. But <laughs> uh, the problem of lookup tables is um, you have to remember that your GPU is feasible because it runs on GPUs. Mm -hmm. And GPUs really, really depend on their local memory. So if you got, can't if you can't stuff your lookup table into every GPU's local memory, you have a problem because it takes something like 600 calculation cycles to get something from your local memory, longer to get something from your host memory. So if you can, you want to avoid that and our costs. 
So the problem is that you can do quite a lot with lookup tables, but they tend to be huge. That's why I mentioned the information in a certain sense as a compression algorithm. Yes, but even then, lookup tables for those kinds of things can still be huge, even if you use interpolation. The, the, and the you, sizes we are talking about here are 64 kilobytes. For the fastest memory? Oh, we need, that's, that's, that's not even the fastest. You can even go and get faster if you press on one kilobyte or something like that. That's the actual instruction cage for each computa uh, C, uh, computation unit. And so if you can fit something in that, that's great. That's perfect. But you have to fit it in there. And so in that's small. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really small. That's the problem. We need these people who did a lot of C64 programming. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, you have typically three different levels of cage. You have the actual L1 instruction cage. Mm -hmm. That's, in essence, directly close to your adder or logic unit or whatever. Um, really, really fast, but really, really small. And you have L2 cage, which is yeah, I can get about um, a few kilobytes of memory in that. That takes me a few cycles to get to that, and then you get L3 local cache, which are which are then something like 32 gigabytes if you're lucky on your GPU card. But you have to wait 600 cycles to get something from there, just waiting for it to happen to you, to be sent to you. And don't start thinking about how long it takes to get something from host memory. Host memory is beautifully large. You can even get something like terabytes of host RAM memory currently, but it takes forever compared to volume. Okay. I have a technical question. Can we go back to uh, slide 24? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like two hours ago. <laughs> just, just uh, maybe you explain it, but why do you need one byte per state? Uh, because I wanted to have at least a few different, uh, so uh, in essence, one byte, um, the idea that behind that is that you say, okay, we want to somehow represent the distribution and we want to have a density which is not one and zero. We want to have uh, some degrees of different densities. And therefore, one byte or eight bit is so your, so your state itself has an internal. Feature? Not in what I implemented. The implementation is simply a state is an integer number. Yeah. But that's not we. Uh, this that's this specific um, idea is still before that. So this here we're still thinking about. Okay, can we cram one distribution in one macro particle? Even if you would say one microparticle is just one bit, yeah. you just store one bit, it doesn't matter if at 10 to the 28 or 10 to the 55, that's just divided by eight. Yes, yeah, so I was just wondering why a state is a byte. It, it, unfortunately, it does not help you to say, if you can really, you could also would have said a long byte, it doesn't matter. It's just doesn't matter. <laughs> a word or a long word, doesn't matter. At the moment, it doesn't have any combination. Uh, it's just some sort of uh, approximation of minimal effort. Okay. It, it's, uh, it's only a byte because 8 bit is the lowest you can easily define in C without defining it yourself and give, implementing the algorithm arithmetic itself. So, okay. so the, the whole effort Brian has been making is to reduce as much information and condense it as much as possible and also reducing the effort of, of calculating this. But on modern hardware, it's always better to reduce the memory footprint and keep the calculation time higher because all the modern hardware right now allows for many more calculation cycles than if you fetch a single byte of information. You can do 600, some 600 or more calculation cycles on a single byte. So you want to reduce the information you're actually working on as much as possible and can do much more concrete calculations. So recalculating things is a very good way because it ba basically comes for free. Every time you get some information, you have a lot of time to do calculations with it. That was different when I was a kid. 
now it is like it is. <laughs> so that's actually a construction uh, parameter you give for a specific uh, computational hardware. That also depends on which hardware you're using. So if, if your CPU is, for example, optimized for about 10 floating point operations per fetch or something like that, GPUs are much more optimized for many floating operations on the same data point, simply due to the fact that they are graphic processing unit, and in graphics, that's what's important. And we are simply co-using the architecture to make it cheaper for us. And if you were to create an ASIC, you could, in theory, build it to perfectly match your algorithm, but you would also have to fund the development of this ASIC, because nobody but you could use it. Maybe in the FPGA. Yeah, but FPGAs are also expensive because you simply need die space or to simply give up flexibility for efficiency. They are wonderfully, wonderfully efficient in its signal routing, if it's uh, fast computation, if it's memory access. That's all very good, but they are expensive because they're simply large to do that. Any more questions? I have a basic question. So, in, uh, in your model, so pick ion still represents one, uh, pick ion with atomic state still represents one ion, one atom. Or... Um, if I understand that you correctly, is the question whether a pick ion is equal to one atom? Yes. No, unfortunately not. So, it simply carries one atomic state information. Okay. Very complicated because you basically think of a 60 phase space mm -hmm. and a pick ion is one point in that. It's not one point, but it's actually you, you cut out a little, usually something like a belt shaped density curve out of that. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, a, you have a phase space density and your pick ions. In space, space exactly in in momentum it is it is one dimensional mm -hmm. or zero dimensional actually mm -hmm. so you just make cuts in your phase space and these are represented by a pig ion by a macro ion and now you somewhat have to match atomic states to this very strange thing which is neither a particle nor a fluid element something in between it's like a representative sampling of your space in a certain sampling way. But because they behave very much like particles in their dynamics, this is why we also couple the atomic state to the particle, because it finally changes the dynamics. If the charge state is different, then it will react differently to a force that is proportional to its charge state, of course. So we somehow have to couple it to that particle, but how we do it, that's basically what, what Brian was suggesting, somehow always switching between a general statistical description and a more or less particle description. And that's the whole point behind PIG. When can I look at the PIG macroparticle as a particle? And when can I look at it as a cut out statistical sampling? of my general phase space. And when that's the nice thing, but also the horrible thing about this whole technique, because I'm switching around all the time whenever I deem it feasible. And people get really confused about this. Even people who have been working on this for 30 years usually say, oh, look, it's a particle. And I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> but, but in that case, how, where is the mass? Like, when you want to do the particle push up uh, yeah, what's the mass of the one part, pig particle? So, um, in principle, what uh, pig party doesn't have a um, defined mass, but it has a defined uh, ratio between charge and mass, because pig particles also have weight, um, which mm -hmm. essentially is multiplied with that. And yes, it behaves like a particle if you look at the pusher, but that's just because we want to have particle-like trajectories. But it isn't actually a particle. <laughs> okay, so, so your so one thing I missed is so okay, so your atomic 
internal structure of your bit particles. How does that actually influence your uh, your um, pick simulation? Pick simulation, I mean the, the Maxwell inflation rate. Where does that go in? Uh, so coupled to the uh, your electron loses energy if it if it interacts with an uh, atom, an ion, or atom, and um, changes its atomic state, or can also gain energy. Yes, and this changes its momentum. Its momentum creates a current, and a current okay. changes your field. Okay, a little bit indirectly, but yeah. Okay, so the current is the yeah. That's the that's the peak. Which is very nice because it's a fundamental quantity, unlike putting, like you suggested, some energy back into a bath, which is undirected. I can now even look at something like uh, uh, reactions really onto, an, onto a momentum. Yeah, but due to the fact, uh, the current implementation of um, the uh, feedback from atomic state changes to electron energy state change. That one is unfortunately not uh, direction sensitive because it's simply. There are, I have ideas to implement it. November. <laughs> so it puts Come on. on. It's excellent right now. Nobody else is doing that on that level. <laughs> you, in principle, you could it. do something like that if you use binary collisions for the yeah. feedback. Uh, but of course, it's a little bit more complicated. Than, yeah. yeah. After I, I would talk say the game level on. you have reached right now is sufficient for a master. <laughs> <laughs> More than that, actually. <laughs> Any other question? No, just one more. So the number of particles in the simulation is conserved. Like, will it remain the same even if there's some ionization? Like, do you create a big uh, Ions, yes. Electrons, no. Okay. So the big electron number changes. You can ionize it. Oh, yeah. we, we also already have implemented and are going there on actually particle splitting and fusing techniques. But this is mainly for, for actually patterning phase space better. So we, we have implemented this also for some radiation effects that you can split a macro ion into two or macro electron fusing two or three electrons into one. That would especially be important if uh, one were to do uh, binary um, ionization and search and forth because, uh, or binary capture, because you don't necessarily have a picking GPU um, that the weight of an electron and ion are always the same. Because we have different weights and matching them together is quite something I would like to avoid because that's uh, difficult. <laughs>